If we leave the European Union with no Article 50 deal in place, which is the, which is the basis of, the, uh, of our inquiry, um, from which decision-making structures uh, related to uh, both defence policy and foreign policy we're going to find ourselves excluded from? Shall I start? Why not? Uh, I think all of them is the short answer. Uh, that uh, we would be uh, outside the European Council, Foreign Affairs Council, Political and Security Committee, uh, all of the, the working groups for common foreign security policy, uh, and ditto for all of the CSDP uh, institutions that we wouldn't have our representative of the military committee, uh, for example. Uh, so we would be uh, in a situation akin to all other non-member states who aren't participants within the CFSP process or the, the CSDP process. What, what levers uh, of foreign policy and weight are we going to lose if we lose access to the EU's treaties with states in uh, Europe's neighbourhood, such as Ukraine and Tunisia? Well, we would no longer be um, parties to any agreements that the EU has with those countries. So in a trade sense, we'd have to make new, new arrangements. Um, in a political sense, again, we wouldn't be taking part in association councils or the like. So. Uh, that's one opportunity for dialogue with those countries which would be which would be lost but obviously we would also be able to have bilateral relations with them as we do now and if you if one's looking at our relations with Tunisia for example now uh, how uh, I'm not conscious that our relations particularly around you know, security of tourists and the travel advice and the rest of it seems to be the principal bilateral preoccupation, um, uh, that wouldn't be affected at all, would it? Uh, on the whole, it would not. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the protection of British citizens would be as it is now. Uh, the one difference, I suppose, is that if in the past uh, all, all 28 have been able to go and talk to the Tunisians about shared concerns about security and so on, uh, we now wouldn't be associated with that uh, unless it were agreed locally that we should be associated with that. But you, you wouldn't be going in with, as it were, the full weight of the, um, the EU behind you. Do you think it's more likely then that the UK would draw, would draw its assets and funding immediately than go ahead with contributing to operations where it's got no say even if it thinks it's a good idea? Well, I mean, that seems to me to be cutting off your nose to spite your face. If you think that the operation uh, is a good idea, I mean, you know, if we take Atalanta, if we still think in 2018 that there is a problem with piracy in the Gulf of Aden, then presumably it would not be in our interest to say, well, we're not going to have anything to do with this operation any longer. Um, and if it fails, that's your problem, because it would be our problem too. The, you know, other countries have decided to participate on a case-by-case -case basis, including the United States, which has sent personnel to, to some of the civilian uh, CSDP operations. But the same thing holds you know, in terms of the, the decision-making process, that they don't actually they don't get a, more of a say, even though it's the United States. So you know, all non-member state participants are treated in the same way, which is uh, treated, in effect, as having a sort of second-class or, or associated relationship rather than being there when the mission is defined. Well, some of us think Brexit is cutting off our nose <coughs> to spite our face, but I'll leave it there. Um, we are great contributors of the intelligence on which sanctions regimes in the EU uh, are based. And that, that's um, a problem both for us and for the remainder of the EU when we leave. Uh, if we continue to think that, for example, um, sanctions in relation to Zimbabwe or sanctions in relation to Iran would be an appropriate response to some situation on the ground, um, then not only would we have to find some way to persuade the rest of the EU in order to make those sanctions maximally effective, but we'd also have to find some 
appropriate way to share the information that would enable you to construct a sanctions regime. Um, and that might not be entirely straightforward in, in legal terms, in terms of uh, data protection and so on. So if the UK decided to take a much more bilateral approach um, and to extend sanctions, say either against Russia or one of the other countries you've mentioned, given that it is coordinated across the EU, given the UK has this reputation for providing most of the intelligence, would it carry much more weight if the UK decided to increase its sanctions against any of these third party regimes? I, I can't think of any country where the trade with the UK is so great that the UK on its own would be able to have much impact. Uh, but if you take the sanctions, say, in the past on Burma or on Zimbabwe, those were cases where the UK was able to persuade a largely indifferent EU to do something that contributed to some UK political goals in those two countries. And I think that's the sort of area where it would be much harder to envisage getting 27 not very interested countries to do something for the benefit of a non-member state. There's issues around the UN and coordination within uh, the UN. And, and I think it's worth thinking now about where we might want to be in terms of uh, our exit from the EU for, for UN coordination, because there, you know, the member states do coordinate that regional groups tend to be the key drivers uh, within the UN system, and we'll obviously be leaving uh, a group that exists. So we've got to think about you know, what other groups we might want to to align ourselves uh, with, and whether that will will give us the same sort of purchase as we've got at the moment. And apart from the UN, how about organisations like NATO, for instance? Uh, would there be any knock on effect? in our cooperation there, bearing in mind that there are a number of EU countries that are not members of NATO. Well, I mean, some of the EU countries that are not members of NATO nonetheless have a very close relationship with it, such as uh, Sweden and Finland um, in particular. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of variable geometry in all of these relationships. Um, I mean, on the whole, I don't think it will affect our position in NATO. Um, although, given some of the pronouncements from the President-elect in the United States, uh, I, I do have some concerns about uh, where NATO might be headed um, and just um, how uh, durable the US commitment may be if the uh, President-elect carries through some of, his, uh, some of his statements on the alliance. So I, I think you know, NATO is a very good place for us to, to have as long as the Americans are fully committed to it. And, and if it was an acrimonious departure of the UK from the EU, how would that be seen in the global community? Would it, would it be something that would affect our reputation or would it actually affect the EU's reputation for allowing a situation to occur whereby Britain as a friendly ally neighbouring the EU um, is outside but they've left an acrimonious environment uh, in, uh, on our departure. Well I'm afraid I don't think the rest of the world sees it like that. I mean even in the US they regard the responsibility for this as being firmly on the side of the UK not on the side of the EU. We voted to leave so it's not up to the EU to find a way to uh, uh, to accommodate us. It's up to us to find a way not to do too much damage on the way out from the perspective of many people. So uh, I think even among some of our closest allies, they're likely to put the blame for any acrimony on the party that decided it wanted a divorce. So you don't think that they might see it differently in the sense that we are exercising our free will to make our own choices and they perhaps want to make things difficult for us. You don't think that actually by doing that, that will harm their reputation rather than ours. They don't make life difficult for other countries who choose not to be in the EU, so why would they make life difficult for a country that's experienced the EU and decided it didn't like it? Well, it depends what you, what you mean by making life difficult for us. I mean, you know, if, if it's a question of um, if, if we go on to the same sort of terms as any other third country, 
does that count as acrimony? I mean, it wouldn't be an optimal solution for the UK, but it would be the, the EU treating the UK on the same basis that it treats the United States or Canada or any other country. Frankly, we, we are facing the most uncertain period uh, in our international relations uh, since, since the Second World War. And for us as a country, you know, we are now facing the sort of double uncertainty of our transatlantic anchor uh, and also our, our sort of EU uh, anchor, uh, if you like, which means that uh, I think that we've got quite a lot of things to sort of weather between uh, now and then. So um, uh, I, I think we need to be positive and optimistic about the, you know, what we might do as a country and what we might do in a foreign security and defence policy. And I think it would be a fantastic time to be in the foreign security and defence policy business in terms of the need for creative and original uh, thinking. But I think uh, uh, how good the future looks like is not going to be in our hands. Mr. Bond, smart choice. Any other uh, unlike, unlike Richard, I'm a pessimist, um, on the basis not least that if I'm wrong, at least I'll be happy to be wrong. <laughs> um, I, I, rather, I, I rather doubt it. I think we um, are contributing to unsettling a continent that faces a lot of challenges, and I don't see that as being good for us. Um, the English Channel does not get any wider after we leave the EU and the problems on the other side of it are going to be just as much of our concern as they have ever been. It's just that we will not uh, any longer have a seat at the table uh, in order to influence them and that seems to me to be rather a poor deal.